Good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing all right? Can you hear me? <laughs> all right, let's turn our uh, handles to uh, hip number 575. Things down there for our food collection there on the 9th and the 16th. 
if, uh, if you can, remember to bring some, some of that food to kind of stock our pantry, but also get ready for uh, Christmas baskets. Christmas, the other day, well, oh, I think it was Cherry comes in the, the room the other day, it was on 25th, and she says, five more months till Christmas. I don't know what she's hitting at, but that's what she said. So I said, okay. I, I don't know if she's making a list or not. She just, you know, she's just letting me know. Start saying that. What's that? Start saying that. I need to say that. Is that it? Right. Well, let's continue in our worship together as uh, we come and turn the page back a little to 572. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. All right. Let's see. Uh,
time of, of prayer, uh, a time for us just to go to Him and thank Him for Father, as we come before you, we are grateful for songs, for praise, to be able to share and lift up to you just how worthy you are and what you do, that we can lean on your arms, that we can have an assurance in you, that we can say it as well, because we have peace with God and have the peace of God. Now continue just to bless us now in our worship. May our hearts be open to hear. May your word stir us and stir within us action. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Thank you. 
from them. But I ask too that uh, a couple of families that have uh, lost loved ones that are uh, attached to me. Uh, a year ago, tomorrow, uh, yeah, my brother passed. So I ask that you be in prayer for his family, his wife, uh, two daughters, and two grandchildren. And I just found out uh, as I was coming over here uh, that uh, my high school basketball coach passed away. He was a Christian uh, and he had a huge impact on a lot of people, a lot of boys, especially as an math teacher too, but a lot of boys uh, who played basketball for him. And, uh, and uh, uh, as I say, he was a Christian. And uh, I remember some years ago when uh, they inducted him into the, our high school hall of fame, that, one of the uh, basketball players got up and not there at the school, but at a dinner, and he shared how uh, Coach Irvin had uh, led him to the Lord. And the difference of that made, not playing basketball, but coming to know God. So be in prayer for the Irvin family. Uh, my family, except for Abby's, going to be Beth and Jerry, they went to visit. Well, you know, I told you about uh, Katie's car, you know, breaking down. And we swapped cars out. Uh, she, she took her mom's car and I got her car fixed here. So they were planning to go anyway, but they were taking her car back and picking up. You know how it goes. <laughs> so it's never ending. It's, it, it's okay. But so pray for them as they travel. There are others in our congregation. They're lonely, and uh, not just in our congregation. Uh, met a woman this past week. She has nobody, no family. She has friends in common, no family at all, and uh, she lives by herself in her home. And she said, she, she said it once. She said it about thirty times. You know, she said, "I'm lonely." So remember those. So there are a few kids that maybe. To help somebody who's feeling lonely that you know, and then spend a little time with them, or even if it's just talking on the phone. Let them know. As we go to our scripture this morning, let's just bow for a time of quiet. Let me ask you in this that you prepare your hearts and thoughts and focus. Just bow your heads. If you have your Bibles, let me ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you looked at your bulletin, you saw the title of the uh, sermon. What do you think we're going to talk about today? Prayer. Prayer. I think that uh, really in uh, our state of affairs, if you will, in our world today, that God's people should be praying. TV show that had policemen in it? 
You know, sometimes when they interrogate somebody or want to talk to somebody, there's good cop and bad cop. And when I talk about prayer life, just a minute, I'm going to say something as a bad cop. Then I'll come back and say something as a good cop, okay? So we're okay, all right? So I'll be both. D.A. Carson said that if you really want to embarrass the average Christian, just ask him or her to tell you about his or her private prayer life yesterday. What if I ask you, tell me about your prayer, private prayer life yesterday? How'd it go? For the bad cop, I'd say something like this. You know, for most of you, your prayer lives are pathetic.
It is through prayer that we receive Him and we see Him. See, prayer is the conduit by which God's power comes into our lives. Notice I said prayer is the conduit. Not a conduit, but it is the conduit for power that can come into your life and your family's life. Prayer is the wire, if you will, that connects us to the electricity of the power of God. So if you sever that wire, if you don't pray, then that severs your connectivity to electricity and you're cutting yourself off from the means by which God puts blessings and power into your life. And let me say this, prayer is not just asking God for things. It really is more than that, but it is the power that God gives us in our lives to receive the blessings that God has for us, the promises that He has for us, and it's through the power of prayer that they come. There are over 667 recorded prayers in the Bible. I didn't count them. Someone else did for me. Thank you. And there are 454 direct mentions of answers to those prayers. Samuel Chadwick in his book, The Path of Prayer, says this, The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from prayer. Our enemy fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Prayer turns ordinary mortals into men and women of power. Prayer brings fire. Prayer brings rain. Prayer brings life. Prayer brings God. There is no power like that of prevailing prayer. Here in Matthew 6, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and as God, Jesus went up on the hill and, and talked to his disciples. The indication is it wasn't just the 12, there were a lot more to them. And in Matthew, he puts it in a sermon so that if you have a red letter edition of the scriptures, from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, just about all of it's red. R-E-D, not R-E-A-D. Red. Come. In Luke, when we come to the section that we're going to look at about this prayer, this model prayer, his disciples come to him and say to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Jewish people. If you looked or saw a very an Orthodox Jew, especially if you went to Jerusalem, and they, I hope one day all of you would have to have an experience, but anyway, they, they will come to where they live, and they will walk to the uh, Temple Mount, and they will can't go up on the mount today, so they are there at the Western Wall, or what used to be called the Wailing Wall, and there, many of them are there for hours or all day to pray. And yet the disciples of Jesus, who probably went to synagogue school, like many of us went to Sunday school, and who learned how to pray, said to him, teach us to pray. We don't know how to pray. And here in Matthew 6, Jesus begins to tell us about that. And there's so much to be said, we're not going to look at the whole prayer. We're going to look at the first couple of phrases, because in them, Jesus reveals two attributes or two character qualities of God that serve as a foundation for prayer. So that if you get these two qualities, if you understand these two qualities, it will transform prayer from something that you think you have to do to something that you want to do, that you love to do. Prayer will almost become a natural for you as breathing. But first, Jesus has to tell us what prayer is not for us to understand what prayer is. So he starts in verse 5 there in chapter 6. And so he says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. And truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So Jesus here is describing a person who prays a lot. And the person prays a lot because they figure that in doing so, they will gain the respect of who? Those around them. Oh, my Aunt Mary, she prays a 
feelings all the time. And you should hear the prayers that she pray. Oh, I wish. I wish I could be like Aunt Mary. Oh, I, it's just, it just sounds so good. Now, I'm not getting on to Aunt Mary. I don't know about her prayers, but if the, her heart is such that she prays those prayers so that people will respect her, and here's what they did in, in times of Jesus. We're talking about the Pharisees and others who would stand on the street corners, who would come into the synagogues, and who would pray prayers that everybody could hear. And oh, how eloquent they were. And oh, how beautiful they were. And oh, I wish I could pray like he does. Well, for us, I, I wish that I could pray like she does. And so they gather and garner the respect of others. But Jesus said the right way to prayer is, when you go to verse 6, what does he say? But when you pray, the Lord teaches you to pray. Okay, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You'll be rewarded for prayer in secret. But then nobody can hear what I have to say. But nobody can tell how wonderful it is. And I, no one can say, I've been working on these prayers. I've been trying to get it just right so that God hears me know. He says, God will reward you. And what will he reward you with? What will he reward you with in secret? Who is there with you in secret when you pray? Who's there with you? God the Father. Your reward for going in prayer is to have the presence of the Father with you. That's the main reward of prayer. He says the reward of prayer is to know God. To spend time with the Father. And not because you're compelled to, but because you want to. Because you love God. Not out of a means to get respect for others. And I guess you can explain or expand that in his reasoning. Some people see when they pray, they use God as a means to get what they want. That's what they look at it as. God, this is what I want, so I'm going to use my prayer to do it. I want a good life. I want a good mate. I want a stable career. I don't want to go to hell. And those are good things. And there's nothing wrong with being praying about that. But if you love those things and you don't love God, then saying those things are just a means to get to those things, not a way for you to love God. So I can ask this question, I guess, do you find God primarily useful or do you find God beautiful? Is he a way to get to a blessing? Or is he beautiful because you spend time with him? You know the difference. Think about it this way. If you were in business with somebody, you had a business partner, you didn't really like them, but hey, you had a good business, you know, together. But when you talk to that person, it's all business. That's all your conversations are. It's about business. But when you meet somebody who you really love, some of you may have to think back a lot of years, you just want to spend time with them. There's no agenda. You just want to be with them because you love them. Not because you have to, because you want to. And when you love someone, you love being in their presence. And this is what Jesus is saying about prayer. When you love the Father, go to Him in prayer. Does He mean something to you? Is it an object or is He beautiful? What is your prayer life like in secret? Look at verse 7 again. He tells us, what not to do. But when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles 
And when you read Gentiles there, uh, what God, uh, Jesus was saying is that those who don't know, do not know God as Father. Don't be like those people who don't even know Him as Father. Don't do what they do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. So what he's saying here, the word that he uses there about those phrases is the word for babbling. Babbling. Don't be like those who don't know the Father and just babble and just say, you think that, you know, if I sweat enough, if I scream enough, if I stop my feet enough, if I repeat the right words at the right time, in the right way, in the right cadence, then God's going to hear me. And you know, many religions teach this kind of prayer. If you're a, a Catholic, you know, you do the Hail Mary full of grace. I just thought that was a football play, you know, the Hail Mary. But no, you know, that's how you pray. And I'm not getting on Catholics, okay, to understand that that is part and parcel of some of their prayer life. And every religion has it. Islam, that you know, read the verses of the Quran, and for Hindus, you would read that. You would chant uh, things from their uh, sacred writings. And for some people, even in Christian circles, if you just say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, if you do it enough, then that's gonna, it's going to work. When you think about that, it's kind of silly, isn't it? How many of you have had kids or grandkids who, who just, you know, they think that they say it enough, loud enough, but you'll do it? Let's go to McDonald's. Let's go to McDonald's. McDonald's, 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 McDonald's. Let's go, let's go. They just sound like a train going. Blah, 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 blah. And I don't know about you, but you know, somebody doing that over and over and over and over and over again doesn't make you want to love them. In fact, they might get annoyed about it. Do you think that's what God wants? That's what he's saying. Do you think that's what God wants from your prayer life? Repeating phrases doesn't loosen God up to make him like us. See, the real problem, Jesus says, is that the assumption among the Gentiles, as it was, was that God is naturally hostile toward us. So that if we will uh, say these kind of things, or if we get this, we'll, we'll get his attention, and then maybe he'll hear us. But God's not like that, and the gospel is not that you finally become good enough personally, God approves of you, and then he'll do what you ask him to do. No, the gospel is that Christ's righteousness is ours and is given to us as a gift, and we are accepted not because of the things that we say, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We are adopted as sons and daughters of the living God through Jesus Christ. And he says to us, your father knows what you need before you ask. So here's what you're supposed to do. Pray like this. Our father in heaven. And so that's the first thing that I want us to look at. The fatherhood of God. And when he said our father, he used an Aramaic word that means daddy. Disciples, you need to pray like this, Daddy. I remember sitting in a, a conference, mostly youth ministers or activities directors, and the pastor was there to read the devotionals, us, uh, came in prayer, and he just said, Hey, Dad, it's it's kid. And then he just talked to him like he was his dad. We, were, we just happened to be there listening. And he didn't care if we were there or not. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful way to pray. Because, you know, the way I knew. Our Father, who's in heaven. Why is it that our voices get lower when we, you know, we slow down? They get lower when we pray? But all he's saying is, and what Jesus says to us, is you say, hey, Daddy. And the reason we can say, hey, Daddy, is because we are and have been adopted into his family as his sons and daughters. The 
Think about your own children if you had them. And, you know, your heart doesn't change toward them. Your affections don't change. They, they really don't and shouldn't have to earn your affection. They love you and you love them because they are yours. They belong to you. They're your children. And when my kids do things that I'm not pleased with, I still love them. And I will still listen to them. See, the gospel is that God has adopted us into his family, on, again, on, based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you come to, to, to God in prayer, it is as if he says, if you are here, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased, and I will listen to them. Why? Because Jesus is there with God, the son is with the father, and he says, Father, they belong to you. Father, you're making them to be like me. Father, they have the rights of heirs. They belong. They are sons and daughters. I can't be more accepted by God because I am a child of God because of Jesus Christ. I think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. If I asked you to describe God in one word, and you haven't heard this sermon yet. What do you think? Don't tell me, but write it down. What is that one word that you would use to describe God? One word that you would use to describe God right now. This is who I believe God to be. And we might write him. I mean, some, there's some good things out there. We might say, oh, he's awesome. He's glorious. He's, he's wonderful. Some people, he's a man upstairs. Well, that's more than one word. But still, you know, that's... It's how they look at him, or, you know, he's just a, you know, a cosmic policeman. He's the judge, whatever you use. But Jesus says, according to his word, that God is Father. And I want to take us a little deeper in the theology, this is studying that, but I really do want us to take just a little bit deeper this morning when I say to you that God is Father, when, when Jesus says that God is Father, I want you to understand That for all eternity, God has been Father. He has always been creator. He became the creator when he created. He has always been the judge. He became the judge when there was something to judge. But for all eternity, he has been Father. Because for all eternity, he has been the Trinity. He has been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is never a time when there was not God the Son, and so there's never been a time that there has been God the Father. From the very beginning, that is His essence. And so we can understand why John says in, in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. And God created us to share in that love and who He is. And we sinned and we made ourselves His enemies, so He bought us back. So we can relate to him. And the essence of salvation is not that we are a slave who has been forgiven, but that we are a son or a daughter who has been restored by the Father. So I ask you, what's that one word that you would use to describe Father? The problem is that for many, and incidentally, and it is really surprising, but they've had bad father experiences. <coughs> Sigmund Freud uh, said that nothing destroys someone's faith in God like a bad relationship with their dad. And he should know he had a terrible relationship with his father, as we read about it. And in fact, <coughs> by the way, Freud was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He talked about it, but he didn't believe in it. Many of the atheists, as we look at their own personal stories in the, in the last couple of centuries, as we look at them, all of them just about had a terrible relationship with their earthly father. And so when it came to God, they didn't have an example for them here on earth about a good father. They had a bad father. And so they felt that there could not be a God who could be father. And so it made it difficult for them to have any kind of faith. And it made it difficult for them to uh, believe in God. In fact, they would say they hate God. And the reason they hated God because actually they hated the devil because they mistaken the devil for God. 
because of the earthly father that they had. And Jesus taught us to pray, and he taught us to pray, Father, Dad. And I want you to hear a word of scripture that kind of says something about God as Father found in the Old Testament in Isaiah 43. It says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Listen to God's word and what he says about you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. He knows you individually. You are mine, he says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. When you go to the worst things on earth, you have a Father who is there with you. Grab a hold of that. Understand that. And when we come in prayer, we come before our Father who is there for us, who understands us, who is there with us. In John chapter 11, we find the shortest verse in the English Bible. And don't you remember when you were younger in school and they said that, all right, someone tell me a Bible verse, man, you don't want it to be first because you wanted to get John 11, 35 out because it's Jesus' way. So we see, I know a Bible verse. Jesus' way, it's the shortest verse in the English Bible, but it's a couple words long. There is in the Greek, there's a shorter verse, which is one word long, but it's like, you know, and they said to themselves, so, I mean, that's, but Jesus wept. When you look at that and you look at the story that was there, and if you see that, you, you understand that Jesus comes and Lazarus is dead and everybody is hurting and everybody is crying. And, but Jesus knew what he was going to do, didn't he? Why in the world did he weep when he knew that in just a few minutes he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead? He's a God who cares. He's a God who walked with those people. He's one who feels your pain. He understands your pain. He understands your loneliness. He understands your brokenness. And He's there with you. He is your Father who, in all of this, He weeps with you and He feels your pain and He shares that brokenness. And He's there with you as Father. And he goes on in, in Isaiah, he says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, and peoples in exchange for your life. How precious are you that God has done that for you, and he's using the metaphor of ransom. You are so precious that I will give anything for you, and I will do that for you. A team that wants to have a player on it, and they're willing to give up everything really to get that one. How precious is that player? In fact, there was an NBA coach who gave up his starting five on his roster to get one person. And how precious it is that coach did. Now, I think about God and how precious you are to Him and what He did for you, and how, how wonderful He is when He can you. Imagine what Jesus went through so that you could be ransomed, so that you could be redeemed. They despised him and they rejected him and they spit on him. And they nailed his hands and his feet to a cross and they, they whipped him with a cat of nine tails and they ripped the flesh off his back. go to him and you want to be near to him. You understand that he, he does understand your pains and everything. 
He does understand what it means to carry your needs. And you can be like the hymn writers who have written, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, it calls me from a world of care. It bids me ere my Father's throne and makes all my wants and wishes. He's your Father. I'm going to go quickly. It took me a long time to get to point one. So let me get to point two go through that. And that's the sovereignty of God. Jesus said, when you pray, you pray our Father who art in heaven. And you pray, you pray this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In prayer, you're supposed to discern what God in heaven wants. And that's what you're supposed to ask for. In fact, if you want a really good, short, tight definition of prayer, it's that you discern what God in heaven wants, and that's what you ask for. Well, doesn't God know everything anyway? Isn't it going to happen no matter what I do? Well, that's not, I mean, it's true, but it's not all there is to it. And God said in Isaiah 46, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please and he will because he is sovereign. But here's the thing that we need to understand that in his sovereignty, he wants us to be part of that. And when we pray, our prayer helps to complete, if you will, God's purpose. And that's from our perspective, not God's perspective, from our perspective. David Platt, who uh, used to be the, uh, the uh, uh, executive director of the International Mission Board, and recently he's gone back into the pastor in, in, uh, in Virginia, he said this, It is true that the purposes of God are unchanging, but the plan of God, from our perspective, is unfolding. And when we know that God puts us in a place to claim His unchanging promises, we can change the destiny of situations. Because God has hardwired the universe to run on prayer. Did you know your prayers make a difference? Your prayers make a difference. He goes on to say that when we pray, we take our God-given place and use our God-ordained privilege to participate with Him in the accomplishment of His purposes on the planet. In prayer, we participate with God as things unfold. And I know a lot of this is just, I mean, I say, just give me a little story. But I want you to think about what it means to pray. Moses went up the mountain, and he was gone for 40 days. And the people said, we don't know where he is. And they made a god of gold, a golden calf, and they worshipped him. And they partied, partied at the foot of the mountain. And God says to Moses, Moses, go down for your people out of the, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt and correct themselves. Now let me alone and let my wrath be poured out on them and then I will make you a great nation. Moses comes back to him and he says to God, Oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, with your great power and your mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent that you bring them out to kill them in the mountain? Turn from your burning anger and relent. The word there in the Hebrew means to repent. God is, Moses is saying to God, hey, you don't want to do this. Well, then all of a sudden God forget what he was about and what he did and he didn't know what was going on. Was Moses reminding God, you know, hey, you forgot this, God, you made a promise. Now, the irony of it all is that God is the one who told Moses, I want you to understand what is happening. 
And God put Moses in place to understand what was happening so that Moses would pray to God, perceive his anger, remember God's promise, and petition God to not go through with the destruction of the children of Israel. And what does that mean for us? Very simply put, God wants us to pray to him and he puts us in the places to pray for others so that we can see him act and we pray the promises of God for others. Where do you find the promises of God? Where do you find the promises of God? In the Lord. And so when we know the promises of God, we can pray the promises of God, and we can watch that unfold, the purposes of God unfold in our lives, and we can see that it happens. I've said to you, uh, to this, to you before about somebody, I'll ask them, I say, is there something I can pray for you about? Have you ever done that for somebody? Have you ever said, can I pray for you? Can you tell me something I can pray about? I often get this answer, you might too. I'll just pray about anything. I mean, I mean, just go ahead and pray. Just make it general. And I have said to some of those people, you know, it would be good if it was specific. It's easy to say, God will just be with uh, Sarah. I was choosing the name. God be with Sarah. And God's with you, Sarah. But how do you know your prayer is answered when it's just a general prayer? But if you say to God, God, and you say to someone else, pray this for me. When God answers that prayer, then you know that God answers prayer. And so Jesus says to us to pray to God, our sovereign Father. And when you think about that, that's empowering. For you are where you are by the design of God to call forth the promises of God for those around you, for your own life and for those around you. He's put you specifically right there where you are to pray so that you can see his promises being fulfilled. So pray. Even though God already knows what you need. Because then you'll pray and you'll see. God answered the promises. What I wanted you to learn today, if you hadn't already, I wanted myself was reminded of this, that J.D. Greer uh, heard this, what I've shared with you today from him. I want you to be able to go in prayer, and let prayer be natural and instinctive for you, that that's part of who you are as God's child. And you say, I am, but I also want you to remember that God is your Father. And as Father, He's placing you in the place where your hurts and your needs are taken care of through Him. And when you pray, and it's not a duty, well, I gotta pray, I gotta go pray. And you know when we come to worship, that you know we gotta start with a prayer. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. The prayer I would hope for you becomes less of a duty and more of a privilege. It's something that you get to do. And you get to pray to a father who's sovereign and will see things take place. And you can see things happen in your life. And that gives you power. There were two things that I, I posted this week in Facebook. For some of you, if you're my friend on Facebook, you know that I've been putting just stuff that says God is every day on it. One of the things that I posted was, is this, God is veil terror. He tore the veil in the Holy of Holies from top to bottom and Christ gave him his spirit. The veil was torn so that it, the symbolization of all that was that now that we can come to God. And in Hebrews it tells us we can come to God boldly and confidently in our prayers. Why? Because Jesus the Son is sitting at the right hand of the Father and He's there to intercede on our behalf. So when we come in prayer, we pray in secrecy, we 
pray in the presence of God. And as we're in the presence of God, Jesus the Son is there in the seat. He said, God, this is my child. This is your child. God work through them. And God work through me. And let me see your promises take place. Let me see you fulfilled. Prayer is such a wonderful and beautiful thing. It's a way for us to trust our Father. It's a way to come to Him. Not so much to get what we need, but to pray for the things that God wants to see those things take place. Let's pray. Father, I know this morning that there was a lot, and I know it may have even done, it may have even bored people, Father. But I trust and I pray. We have a heart that wants to come to you in prayer, and that prayer isn't about things, and prayer is about this or that, but prayer is about being with you. And Lord, help it to be so. Let us pray in your power, and it does not happen and cannot happen if we don't know you. Jesus Christ is not our Lord's Savior. We cannot come to the Father through the Son. I pray that each of us would look at our own hearts and ask ourselves, am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Do I belong to Him? Did I pray, believing the promises of Scripture, that if I come, He will forgive me of my sins, He will cleanse me of my sins, and I will have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let it be so. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The invitation to him is uh, hymn number 581. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Brother David, I'm going to leave the hymn, but if you could come. Get out of here. Brother David, do you come and just stand here if anybody would like to share a prayer request or come and make a decision. Thank you. 
you to trust him. My prayer for you is that you know him. And I pray that you will spend some time in prayer in the secret with your Father, who will reward you with his presence. Father in heaven, may your grace be ours. May your peace be ours. Your word tells us, as your children, they belong to us. And we belong to you. And this week, we pray, I pray that you will show each of us how wonderful and awesome and mighty you are. And that we will know that our daddy was there for us. Let it be so. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.